I'll begin my discussion with a thought experiment. Um, suppose there's a red button in front of you, and if you push the button, several different things will happen. The first is that a vast number of organisms will come into existence, and most of them will die shortly thereafter in gruesome ways. For example, they may be eaten alive, they may dehydrate or um, starve, they might be um, consumed by internal parasites or succumb to a disease. Um, some of the organisms will live longer, they'll have more complete lives, um, and they'll um, enjoy more of their existence. But they'll also experience a great deal of hardship too. For example, they um, will be exposed to um, poor weather conditions, cold and heat. They may suffer from um, inadequate food or fewer feathers and things like that. And the last outcome of this button is that a great number of um, aesthetically pleasing works will be created, for example, poetry, um, music, and other things that people think are beautiful to look at or to um, listen to. Um, and my question is whether it would be ethically acceptable to press this red button and create these things. And I think it would not be, and I think many people would agree with this assessment, because even though we're creating some great things by pushing the button, we're also inflicting great amounts of suffering on um, vast numbers of organisms. They don't um, deserve to suffer and they are not getting anything out of the arrangement. We're just using them or they, they're they suffering as an incidental byproduct of something that we want to get. Um, but for them, their own sake, they're not getting anything. They're just experiencing a terrible, short, painful existence. So let's keep this thought experiment in mind as we discuss another topic, uh, which is life in space. Um, so I think often astrobiologists, when looking for extraterrestrial life, um, think that the discovery would not just be a momentous scientific breakthrough, which it certainly would be, but would also be a morally valuable breakthrough. That is, they think it would be a, a very good thing in an ethical sense or in a in the sense of being um, uh, good for the universe to know that there's more life out there. Um, and this could come from several different reasons. One could just be they don't want Earth to be alone. It's nice to know that we have others um, like us. Um, and I think it's also because people often think that life is a good thing, and so it would be nice to know that it's not just confined to Earth and that it's more widespread than than to ourselves, at least in our local neighborhood of the universe. Um, and so this idea that life is um, obviously a good thing to discover is apparent in the language that people use. And here are just two recent newspaper um, headlines that illustrate this idea. One is, expectation of ex extraterrestrial life built more on optimism than evidence, study finds. The second is, Analysis, Mars meteorite structures, optimism for alien life. So we can see in both of these articles and in many other places, people use the word optimism as synonymous with finding life. And one reason for that could just be that optimism can mean you're hopeful um, about some outcome, that you're, you think it's probable that some outcome will happen. But the other meaning of optimism is that you think um, you want something, you think that the outcome would be a good thing that you're predicting. Um, and I think it's often just kind of assumed that finding life would be a good thing and that we doubt it would, we, we would be great if we were not alone. Um, sometimes people take this further, not just to say that we want to discover life, but that if there's not life, we should create more life. Um, so some um, scientists actually advocate uh, spreading life to the universe if it doesn't already exist there. This is called directed panspermia, um, the process of seeding planets that are amenable to life with um, biological, um, um, mi either microbial life or, and then later, um, larger kinds of life that are on Earth, and hoping they take root there and establish um, ecosystems on those other planets. Um, it may also take the form of what's called terraforming, which is the process of um, altering the atmosphere and conditions on a planet to make it more suitable for life. So, for example, people talk about 
the possibility of terraforming Mars. And there's debate about whether it's technologically feasible. Um, but the proposal is to um, create some more of an atmosphere and um, make the soil more um, able to support plants. And then eventually plants would produce more gases that could sustain animals and, and things like that. And even if it's not possible on Mars, it's certainly possible on other planets in the um, Milky Way galaxy that are more Earth-like. Um, and panspermia is the idea of um, spreading life to planets that already happen to be in the so-called Goldilocks zone of being the right temperature and having the right mixture of gases and um, being able to support life in, this, in the sense that Earth does. Um, so these are proposals for how to spread uh, biological life into the galaxy. Um, and there are some scientists who think that they're um, not just interesting scientific proposals, but also important moral um, undertakings for humanity. So as one example, here's um, Marshall T. Savage. He wrote a book in 1994, The Millennial Project, Colonizing the Galaxy in ABC Steps. And he expresses the sentiment in a passage there. He says, if we carry the green firebrand from star to star and ignite around each a conflagration of vitality, we can trigger a universal metamorphosis. Because of us, slag will, turn, slag will become soil, grass will sprout, flowers will bloom, and forests will spring up in once sterile places. If we deny our awesome challenge, turn our backs on the living universe, and forsake our cosmic destiny, we will commit a crime of unutterable magnitude. This idea of actively spreading life has been advanced by others as well. Um, Professor Michael N. Mautner um, at Virginia Commonwealth University is another advocate of this. Um, he calls the project, um, or he calls the, the ethical basis of this project, panbiotic ethics, which is the idea that um, we should actively spread life as much as we can. Um, he wrote a paper, um, Life-Centered Ethics and the Human Future in Space, in which he says the following. Life-centered ethics as biotic ethics that value the basic patterns of organic gene protein life and as panbiotic ethics that always seek to expand life um, can, pro can provide guidance um, for us. Um, that's not an exact quote, but I, I mixed around the order there. Um, and he goes on to in talk about the technological feasibility as well as the moral desirability. And he says um, this could help human existence find a cosmic purpose. Um, he said similar things in an article for phys.org um, in 2010. Um, here's a quote from him in that piece. We have a moral obligation to plan for the propagation of life and even to the transfer of human life to other solar systems, which can be transformed by a microbial activity, thereby preparing these worlds to develop and sustain complex life. Securing that future for life can give our human existence a cosmic purpose. Um, so these are proposals that um, some people have made, and there's actually an organization called um, the Panspermia Society, which um, shares these same ideas about the not just the um, possibility, but the moral desirability of spreading life to space. Um, but I want to take a step back and um, have us think about this um, idea more deeply. It's common to think that nature is um, beautiful and therefore it's it's obvious that we, we would want to spread it. Um, it makes us feel good. We um, derive many benefits from nature, not just um, economic and um, like food and shelter and oxygen and, and those things, but also um, a seeming uh, spiritual benefits or relaxation or just um, awe and beauty and so on. And it's um, really interesting to watch nature and ecosystems and how they operate and so on. But when we take that perspective, we are divorcing ourselves from what it's like for the organisms themselves. Um, if we think, for example, about insects, um, a typical insect is born um, and then may die shortly thereafter because there's so much competition among um, the insects that are born. Uh, an, an insect um, parent pair may have, say, hundreds of offspring, and at most two on average can survive to adulthood be in a stable population. Um, even for those that survive, they may live a few weeks, um, enduring 
um, harsh conditions alongside some enjoyment from eating and reproducing or, or other um, activities. Um, and so um, for the insects themselves, it's not such a great thing. For most of the insects, indeed, it's, um, it's a very short, uh, nasty, brutish, and short life, essentially. Um, and this isn't just true for insects, but it's also true higher up on the food chain um, to a greater or lesser degree. Um, larger animals may have longer lifespans. They may have fewer offspring, and so there's maybe less painful death um, per unit of um, life. But even for larger offspring, like larger um, animals like uh, fish or um, amphibians and reptiles and small mammals, um, they may live at most a few years. Um, many of their offspring die young. Even the survivors endure um, fear of predators and um, harsh weather conditions and lack of food and, and many other um, distressing conditions alongside some enjoyments. Um, humans probably have some of the best lives of any animals on the planet on the whole because we are at the top of the food chain. We have uh, shelters. Uh, we, most of us are, are not lacking food on a daily basis. Um, most of us have medicine to prevent many diseases. And so it's easy to project our own um, comfort onto the rest of nature and from our from the inside of our houses or from um, the brief time that we stay in nature when camping or hiking, we think this is very beautiful, but then we're not there during the snowstorms or um, when there are predators chasing us or um, when there's a um, famine and so we can forget how how um, unpleasant nature can be as well um, and so this tendency to project the um, the beautiful or um, happy parts that we see to nature can lead us to think that it would be obviously a good thing to spread life to space um, when in fact if we look at it from the perspective of most of the organisms that have to actually live in those conditions that may not be the case um, people often scientists think about um, engineering life in space as if it's just another engineering project where we spread life we figure out how to make it thrive and um, that's something that we can do um, just as an engineering project and then we'll have um, bases for human colonies or um, we can just spread um, the uh, gene protein um, dynamics that we find on Earth in a, in a way that we want to see. Um, but people forget that life um, has its own perspective and it, it ha there is, um, at least for, the, for um, many animals, there is something it's like to be those animals and they um, have their own, um, their own um, feelings about this and um, many of them may regret the fact that they were created because um, life is so terrible for them. So when we think about spreading life and creating so much um, new life, most of which will die and in painful ways, we have to remember that there's actually um, there are actually um, organisms experiencing that. It's not just inanimate um, engineering that we're doing. Um, sometimes people try to justify um, this cosmic purpose of humanity or the spread of life and um, continued evolution by saying that there's a higher purpose, um, that something besides the welfare of the organisms matters. So even if life is very painful for most organisms, um, the larger process of evolution or, or some other grand purpose like um, sustaining life as long as possible is uh, superordinate to that. And the, um, the organisms suffer for that larger purpose. Um, so this is a view that people sometimes advance, but it's not clear why we would care about those larger goals. I mean, why is evolution a good thing? Why can't we say evolution is intrinsically an evil thing? Um, it's not clear what um, evolution is, is doing that makes us um, like it so much. Um, I guess when we study it, we think it's interesting and that um, releases pleasure in our brains, and so we, we kind of naturally associate evolution with something that's cool and fascinating, and then we like it and we want to create more of it. But 
um, that's something that's going on in our heads, and it doesn't necessarily reflect what the individual organisms experiencing that process would think. Um, if we take the perspective of all those losers, we would we would feel differently. Um, sometimes people say evolution is important because it gave gave rise to um, us, and we like us. Uh, therefore, things that created us are important. Things that created art and literature and civilization are are important um, in and of themselves. Um, but that seems to be misplacing what we value. Um, and in any case, it, it again ignores the experience of all the losers. Um, we are the winners of evolutionary history, but there are many, many more losers. And history is written by the winners, but um, if those losers were writing their history of um, evolution, it would look very different. Um, people sometimes say evolution matters because it's um, pretty or beautiful or aesthetically pleasing or um, complex, but we can draw an analogy to the pleasure experienced by the Romans when they watched um, Colosseum fights with animals um, tearing each other apart. Is that um, somehow different? In both cases, it's some um, activity that's, that's inflicting great pain on animals that we, um, that people looking at it find um, pleasurable. Um, and you can say, well, I, I like evolution, but I don't like Colosseum fights, and that's the end of it. And you can hold that view, but um, from a more distance perspective, it's not clear um, how there's a morally relevant distinction between those cases. Um, isn't valuing the process of evolution sort of like um, enjoying watching a gladiator fight? Um, and then finally, we can point out that people don't even seem to value evolution for its own sake in their own lives. For example, suppose your child came down with a terrible um, viral infection that was likely to kill it. Um, you probably wouldn't stand by and be, be happy about that. From a distanced perspective where you value evolution, you can say, this is survival of the fittest and the virus is more fit than your child, so let na nature take its course and um, stop complaining. But in fact, almost everyone would be very upset about the virus um, killing their child. Um, and so when when it becomes personal, we, we stop having this um, abstract, um, far view perspective. Um, you could still say that our impulse to protect our child is part of evolution. It's part of um, a parent's um, adaptation to pass on its genes for it to want to protect its child and be upset when it um, becomes sick, when the child becomes sick. And that's true. Um, it's part of evolution to feel upset like this. But if that's the case, why can't we also say it's part of evolution for us to express our empathy um, and ability to put ourselves in the place of other creatures? And those impulses lead us to have compassion for the many animals that are suffering um, in nature. Um, that response can also be part of evolution, even if it's maybe less adaptive. It, um, is a byproduct of evolution, and, and we can express it just as much as a parent expresses dismay when a child becomes sick. Um, and so that's what I would encourage us to do. Um, I would encourage us to think more about the lives of the animals that are actually be, being created when we undertake these um, cosmic um, life engineering projects. Um, and I would conclude with... Um, a comparison to something from theology, the classic problem of evil. Um, so in that case, it's asked why a good God would create so much suffering in the world. The animals especially don't seem to deserve to suffer. They are not descended from Adam and Eve, who sinned in the Garden of Eden, so uh, it doesn't seem right that they are um, enduring so much, so much torment in nature. Um, and what kind of good God would um, allow this to be created. So we can ask the same question of ourselves if we propose spreading life to the galaxy. Why is it if we care so much about others that we're willing to create um, billions, trillions, maybe quintillions of animals on another planet that will, most of which will endure um, short, nasty, brutish, and short lives? Um, 
And so that's an important question to ask, and maybe the answer is that we should not, or at least we should think more carefully about how we proceed. Um, there may be ways to colonize space that involve less suffering. Um, maybe we can use technology um, to avoid the um, the process of evolution that um, involves so much conflict and instead create a more orderly um, colonization process if people still do really insist on, on spreading humanity to other planets maybe there are more humane ways to do it um, so I'll end there and um, I would just remind us to um, take the, per the perspective of those experiencing um, our colonization process when we consider whether we want to spread life to space.